Good morning and welcome to your TVC News here in Clarence Rockland. It's Friday the 8th of January and a Happy New Year to you all. I'm your host Thomas Stockton, bringing you your latest regional update and the first one of 2021. In your headlines this week, COVID-19 latest in Clarence Rockland and Prescott Russell. The Pfizer vaccine is just round the corner, but cases are still on the rise. Project Safe Trade is launched locally. New educational and employment opportunities available as of this summer and how you can make the most of the winter in the area safely. We start the year with some great news as a vaccine against COVID-19 will be arriving in Eastern Ontario as soon as next week. Speaking on Tuesday night, Dr. Paul Romeliatis of the Eastern Ontario Health Unit explained a little more about the rollout. As you know, there are two uh, vaccines. There's the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. The Moderna has not really started being delivered uh, in, a, in, a, in a routine basis, although the Pfizer has. So up until very recently, there have been some pilot projects, and um, I'm very happy to announce that uh, as of next week, uh, we will be receiving a uh, Pfizer vaccine uh, in our health unit area um, that will be uh, dedicated to uh, vaccinating long-term care uh, staff um, and um, and, fam and uh, essential visitors, and uh, subsequently we'll be receiving another dose, uh, another uh, uh, amount that will be uh, vaccinating uh, healthcare workers. We're, that's the priority group that we're doing following the provincial guidelines. Um, we're also working with the ministry to get Akwesasne um, uh, vaccines as well. So uh, we will be receiving a Pfizer vaccine next week. We'll be receiving one tray, which is about 1,200 dosages. Um, we will initially be receiving it through Ottawa. It'll be sent to us from Ottawa. Um, it will be a thought out version. So we'll have about five days to use it. Um, however, moving forward uh, in subsequent deliveries, we will be receiving um, the Pfizer vaccine directly in Hawkesbury, where we have a uh, uh, minus 70 fridge in the Hawkesbury hospital. And so uh, we'll be able to uh, manage it from there and distribute it. For the time being, what we're doing is uh, we're working with, uh, with our hospital partners uh, to be able to offer uh, vaccine sites um, uh, five vaccine sites in our area. We will be announcing the details shortly. We're just finalizing that right now. That will be exclusively for long-term care staff. Um, and um, uh, we were then uh, a prime, we're, they're also preparing for uh, arrival of more vaccine for their, their, uh, uh, for their uh, healthcare workers in the hospitals as well. One of the things that we are anxious to do as well is we're just waiting for stability information of how we can transport the Pfizer vaccine because we are going to start piloting it as well, hopefully in the next week or so, um, a week or two, uh, that we will be able to go into the retirement, the long-term care homes and actually vaccinate the, the residents there as well and any staff that haven't been vaccinated. So that is good news. So we will be getting vaccine um, effective next week. I'm not sure which day we're going to be rolling it out. It all depends on uh, when we receive it, the thawing and so on. We're getting some information tomorrow about the logistics and we're getting everything organized in that. Uh, we're also going to be receiving the Moderna vaccine at some point, and that's going to be an easier for us to uh, to ship. We have vaccines, uh, fridges, both in Hawkesbury and in Cornwall for, for, the, for those as well. So we're, we're ready to go. We're working with our partners. We're working with our hospitals. We are now, uh, so this phase one really is going to be a, a, a vulnerable and a healthcare worker. So the, it's going to be the uh, uh, long-term care, retirement home, uh, both residents and staff, healthcare workers, um, uh, First Nations, as well as uh, people living at home with home care, uh, severe home care. That's going to be the first swath. That'll take us likely into um, the end of this, this month, uh, into early February. At that point in time, we'll be receiving more vaccine. And at that point in time, we're also going to be then looking at uh, then extending it to uh, frontline workers, um, extending it to uh, indiv elderly individuals outside of homes and so on. And then I believe that by March, uh, we'll be have ample uh, supply, March, April, uh, to do that. Uh, right now, we're, we're basing it on two vaccines, the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. But uh, in, I'm also hearing that the AstraZeneca vaccine may be imminently um, approved as well. So that will add to the vaccine numbers that we have. So that's good news. And we're, we're we're waiting, uh, waiting to go moving forward. Um, uh, so the other question that I've had uh, is, is that 
with uh, are we going to be holding back vaccines? At this point, we have been instructed uh, that with the Pfizer, we're having um, adequate flow of, of delivery that we will, uh, when we get a thousand doses, we're going to vaccinate a thousand people. We're not going to vaccinate half to wait for the dose uh, 21 days later. Apparently, there's now been established a reliable supply. Moving forward, however, uh, for the first batch of deliveries for, Moder for the Moderna one, uh, we have been told that for that, we're gonna be doing half and half, uh, keeping it just to make sure that we have ample uh, uh, regular supply. However, new positive cases of the coronavirus remain high. And although they have started to stabilize, Ontario is still seeing an increase of around 3,000 new cases per day. At the time of recording, there were 85 active cases in Clarence Rockland and 221 in Prescott Russell. Dr. Romeliotis urged caution amongst the community when he spoke on Tuesday night, as the statistics don't yet represent the full extent of the spread that occurred over Christmas and New Year. He added that most of the new cases haven't been linked to outbreaks, but to socializing instead. People have been asking me again where these cases are coming from, and again, I will, I will be, we'll just looking at our statistics now. We're just trying to get them out, but uh, uh, we will be you know, publishing very shortly um, uh, where they are. But I can tell you again, the, I would say close to two thirds of the cases, about sixty percent, sixty-five percent of the cases are what we call um, um, close contact. Uh, most of those are uh, home contacts, uh, living together with somebody who's positive. Uh, but we have in certain areas up to a quarter of those. Uh, that are um, uh, at work uh, or through uh, through contact with a, with a colleague uh, and so on. So um, uh, we're not seeing, this is not driven by outbreaks. Uh, this is driven really by uh, contacts uh, and close contacts. So what, I, what I'm seeing is uh, with these cases that are these household uh, contacts is that uh, one of the reassuring things is that in most situations, we identify the index case, the first case, and um, sometimes it's very hard to you know distance in a home and so uh, if they happen to have six seven members in the home all six of them uh, are positive and that, that adds another six cases from that one case but we've isolated that individual because we've identified that individual as a close contact so it uh, doesn't mean so we've kind of confined it but again we're looking at that the, the, the for the most part these are not driven by outbreaks again these are driven by these isolated cases and again about within that that uh, there's about a quarter of those that are um, uh, work workplace related again staff to staff again uh, one of the major things that we're seeing and I want to take some time to talk about it is that individuals get, they get together because they they feel well uh, they don't have any symptoms and they say, oh, I'm fine. And they kind of let their guard down and they don't wear masks and they, you know, have a party. And then a couple of days later, they get sick. And um, unknownst, unbeknownst to them, they were contagious, you know, two days before, uh, not knowing they were contagious and they spread it. Uh, you know, that's the eight that's called a pre-symptomatic spread, which is most cases, that's what we're seeing. Uh, where they develop symptoms a couple of days later, but they feel well, so they go out and they and they don't, you know, they don't take uh, take any precautions. So, so that's very. Now, back in 2018, it was reported that more than 800 million people used Facebook Marketplace to browse, sell, and buy used items every month, and this was when the feature was only available in the United States. The growth of online secondhand market platforms such as Facebook's have only grown since with the sites that existed beforehand, such as Gumtree in the United Kingdom and Kijiji here locally, have gaining from that popularity too. However, this new method of commerce has become a breeding ground for crimes such as theft and fraud. To help counter this, the Russell County, Ontario Provincial Police Unit announced last week that parking spots outside of the police stations in Embrun and Clarence Rockland have been made available as part of their Project Safe Trade. We spoke to Mayor of Russell, Monsieur Pierre Leroux, who initiated the project after noticing it on social media. Fantastic. Mayor Leroux, thank you very much for uh, joining me today. We're here um, in, on this programme with TVC22 to discuss a new project that's been put in place called Safe Trade. Uh, first of all, could you tell us a little bit about Project Safe Trade, what it is, and why did you feel like it needed to be established? Yeah, uh, Safe Trade is essentially a, uh, a program that's put on by the OPP um, that they allow a few parking spots in, their, uh, in the parking lots of their detachments um, that are designated for an area 
uh, where people can meet up and make exchanges. So for example, if you're buying on Kijiji or you're buying on Marketplace and you're not necessarily comfortable having someone come to your house or you going to their house, uh, you can make arrangements to meet in the parking lot of the OPP station and uh, make the exchange there. This was, uh, this was uh, an OPP initiative that I saw that was, um, uh, that actually uh, started or not started, but was put in place in Hawkesbury. I saw on social media and I, I love the idea. Uh, I'm a big uh, Kijiji and Facebook marketplace kind of guy. And I thought this would be fantastic if we had it in our area. Uh, and I know in recent weeks, at least, uh, I saw I, I saw one personally on social media where a chap was trying to sell a mobile phone. He met up with uh, the supposed buyer at a, a quickie, I think it was, and uh, it turned out to be a scam. And it was two young men who stole his phone off of him. So there are clearly incidents like that that take place. Do you know of any in the local area that have taken place that have prompted this? Or is this more of a, a preemptive initiative? Yeah, uh, in our case here, I haven't heard any stories of that in, in our area. So for me, this was preventative. It was, you know, being proactive. Uh, I had seen it, like I mentioned on social media, I thought it was a great idea. Uh, I had, uh, I had um, uh, a meeting scheduled with the OPP detachment commander. Um, I asked him about the program and he was, uh, he was said, yeah, no problem. We can put that in, in place. It's uh, easy enough to do. So that's how we move forward. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the two places uh, that have this, these safe trade spots at the moment are in Embram and Clarence Rockland. Uh, is there any particular reason those two places were chosen and is it likely to expand? Uh, yeah, well, it was chosen because that's the two uh, police stations we have in Russell County. Um, that's, uh, so th since it's an OPP program, that's the two locations. Um, whether it could expand or not, I'm not sure the OPP program will expand because there is no other uh, police station that, at this point in time in uh, Russell County. Um, but I mean, private enterprises, big chains could start offering similar type of, of programs. Uh, at the end of the day, it's, you know, it's uh, the, the sites aren't monitored by the OPP. But uh, personally, I think if somebody's going to try and scam somebody else, uh, they're probably going to be a little bit more hesitant to, to meet up in front of an OPP station in order to do something uh, illegal, right? So it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful program. I think it's, it's simple uh, and, uh, you know, it gives a little bit of a sense of uh, uh, safety when you come on to the uh, online exchange world. The initiative in Hawkesbury, which inspired Mayor LaRue, wasn't the start of this project, as safe trade spots have been popping up all over the country. However, in Ontario, the push really came in 2013, as OPP Constable Mario Graton told us. Well, back in uh, something that happened back in 2013, uh, where I believe it was in Hamilton, Ontario, a gentleman was selling us the pickup truck. And um, at some point, two buyers came to look at it and decided to go for a ride, a test drive with the owner and uh, unfortunately uh, uh, murdered the, uh, the, the owner at that point. And he was abandoned uh, somewhere where police uh, located the body afterward. And both parties were arrested and uh, charged with uh, murder. So um, we know that like, we hope that these things would, would not happen if they would have to come to an OPP detachment or any police service detachment to uh, try to exchange something or to buy something, uh, to purchase something. So uh, that's the main goal of it, is to try and possibly avoid these things. And Terri yeah, terrible to hear that an, a new online market platform like this, not only terrible to hear that it that it provides a breeding ground for crime, but crime as severe as that one as well. So a fantastic project to set up here, especially locally for people to be able to use. Now there's a few starting to be jotted around and hopefully there'll be more. Do you know if yours has been used much since you started it in October last year? Um, unfortunately, I don't have numbers, but I know, I know it's been used, but I don't know how often or if it's on mostly on the weekends or weekdays, 
but we hope that people work, are, are going to use it as much as the, as much as possible. It's free. They don't have to pay anything. They don't have to call us prior. to just need to show up at the parking space and uh, do the exchange. And and um, but I like to remind the public as well that they don't they don't really have to come here if they're if they're like thirty minutes away or uh, they can always like we're suggesting we're trying to tell people that the best way to do it is not having strangers at your house, is to possibly meet somewhere in a public place, like public area, uh, where it's well lit, or it would be better if it's during daytime, uh, because there are obviously more traffic going by. There's a lot of people uh, that can uh, uh, keep an eye on uh, the transaction. And we're also encouraging people to not to be alone. Every time that they want to come at the, it doesn't have, like I said, it doesn't matter if it's here at the office or if it's anywhere else. Um, they should be together. They, they should have two people doing the transaction, like two buyers and two uh, sellers. Uh, they should be a company. It's safer for everyone. The Employment Services Centre announced last month that new industrial workers will be trained according to the needs identified by local manufacturing and industrial companies. This training project will take place from April to July this year and is aiming to produce 20 industrial workers for in-demand sectors of trade. We spoke to Jean Dubois and Muriel Unor pilon from the Employment Centre in Hawkesbury to tell us a little bit more. The, the programme is based on um, the fact that manufacturing companies are, are having a harder and harder time to hire skilled labor uh, or things like um, welding or CNC programming. Um, so what the idea behind the program is that we're going to offer a pre-training program or a pre um, where, where the people are going to, the people that are participating are going to be uh, touching a little bit on all of these domains. And what we are hoping uh, is that they will be able to develop uh, an affinity with one domain in particular. So maybe Mr. A will like welding, and, but he didn't really realize it because he thought that he would become, he wanted to do a CNC programming. I, I, I've dealt with students like this for many years. And a lot of the times, especially in the, the university that I was working for before, they had a very set idea of what type of program they wanted to do. But once they started doing the program and understanding how vast something is, uh, they kind of strayed off to what they first thought they were going to do and go towards another direction. So the, uh, the program is being offered over 12 weeks, starting in April. Uh, they are going to be doing uh, hands-on courses, uh, the installations here in Hawkesbury with Les Collegiale, but they're also going to be doing um, uh, eight visits uh, to local uh, employers and be able to touch and see uh, all the different domains that exist and all the different possibilities uh, that exist for them. And after the 12 weeks, they will have either two choices. The first choice would obviously be to have a, uh, a, a, a job. Uh, so an employer would, would hire them, sponsor them, and uh, work with, um, um, I'm sorry, I'm looking for the word in English, uh, apprentissage. Apprenticeship. Apprenticeship programs. And so they would become an apprentice. The other option would be that they continue on to La Cité Collégiale and do an apprenticeship program with La Cité Collégiale and then come back to the area and be hired by one of our local employers. So it's a great initiative already looking at trying to retain a workforce, not only at a maybe older age and more skilled age, but also as people trying to break into their careers. Muriel, what do you see as some of the greatest advantages of this program for our area? Well, actually, to be honest, one of the reasons why people uh, are not in trades anymore or are not qualified is because there's a big gap between uh, people who are aging population and uh, people going in um, technology um, careers for the past maybe 10 or 20 years. So with that program, it's going to offer an opportunity to people to be able to um, to recognize um, that they're able to work um, manually and with both technology. Mm -hmm. um, our um, business uh, owners in the area are industrial. They, they are able to put a lot of money with new um, 
technology, machinery. So we need some uh, qualified people that they are able to understand how to uh, program or operate uh, new machinery. So is this course being sort of offered as an alternative, say, university degree, or is it simply the fact that maybe, as you say, in the last 15, 20 years, people have thought too much, the university is the only way to go, and this is just a, a different alternative to try and increase trades? Yes, and uh, it's uh, absolutely a good point. They will be able to practice and recognize that uh, there's good salary rate at the end of the year if uh, they're doing trades instead of going to university. So it doesn't matter after even if they're doing a trade, they can go to university also to get the engineer uh, certificate or diploma, but at least uh, they will uh, realize by visiting um, companies that they are able to, uh, to earn uh, maybe 30, 35, $40 an hour. Now, Christmas may be over and done with, but that doesn't mean that the fun out in the cold has to stop. Living in a place like Ontario, you have to find as many ways as possible to make the most of the cold winter months. And it is especially important to incorporate outdoor physical activities into your routine, especially for your mental health. However, with the pandemic, there is a constant fear about abiding to public health regulations and risking spreading the virus. There are various different areas in which you can make the most of the snow here in Clarence Rockland. And one that has been gaining a lot of attention recently is the Alain Potvin Park. I caught up with councillor for Ward 1, Monsieur Samuel Cardarelli, to discuss the activities on offer and the recommendations to make sure that you keep safe whilst having fun. Sam, thank you very much for coming down here today with me on a bit of a, bit of a chilly day uh, to the Alain Potven Park to talk about some of the safe winter activities available to people in Clarence Rockland. Um, it sort of goes without saying one of them because we can see an abundance of people doing them <laughs> behind you, but what are some of the activities available to people down here? Well, this park uh, opened up uh, last year. Uh, it's been uh, very popular. We have, as you uh, can see behind me, as you just mentioned, is the, uh, the hill to slide. Um, we also have uh, an oval skating rink where you can just casually skate around it. And we have a figure eight for uh, beginners that can definitely come in and, and skate there as well. So we have a, a, a bunch of things. People also come, I've seen them with their cross country skis and their snowshoes to just take advantage of the space that we have in this awesome park in downtown Rockland essentially. And uh, obviously with the milder weather, I say it's cold, that's just me. Um, <laughs> with this milder weather, obviously, it's very popular, meaning that uh, the skate, the, the skating rinks aren't open yet because obviously the ice can't mm. form. But um, we're seeing some overcrowding issues, especially in Ottawa, yeah. where restrictions have been placed on number of people. People are being forced to wear masks. Um, we can see there are quite a few people even down here today at uh, four o'clock in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. So uh, is uh, uh, the city of Clarence Rockland, are you worried about these potential overcrowdings and spreading of the virus? Yeah, we're definitely worried about it and thinking about it as well, especially when we see our neighbours taking such action. Um, I, I think we're going to, you know, just see how things are going. So right now we've... Uh, uh, essentially just uh, sent out memos as reminders <laughs> reminders for for uh, for our residents to make sure that they you know that they they take these restrictions seriously and that they keep their two meters um, wear masks if there's a little bit of overcrowding um, and if they're sick to just stay home and not take part in these uh, these winter activities in our parks just to make sure that we can keep uh, as many people safe as possible. And you mentioned parks there, plural. Um, obviously, the number of people down here at the moment isn't crazy, but you could see how it rapidly gets very busy and people would maybe feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So there are a variety of different areas outside of just Allen Park then where people can go participate in these kind of yeah. winter activities. Yeah, we definitely have a lot of parks. We also have um, parks where you can uh, uh, walk in trails or um, it's essentially it's, it's, it's woods. Um, where you can do cross-country skiing, uh, snowshoeing, and or just walking. Uh, again, weather permitting, for sure. 
uh, but uh, we have a couple of those. We also have La Rose Forest, which is part of Prescott Russell that, uh, that, that people can go out to. Mm. So we do have a lot of green space. We have lots of outdoor rinks. Uh, I know in Rockland, in my ward, I have one, two outdoor rinks, including this one. So three if you, uh, so, so people can, do have options mm. and we don't need to overcrowd and, and especially, uh, you know, just to spread out as best as possible. Um, and to, to, so that everybody does their part. Um, so uh, yeah, again, if weather permitting, we will, all of these will be open in no time. Uh, but if we've had the mild weather that we've been having recently, it's going to take some time because they're all mostly on slabs of, of asphalt. So as soon as the sun's out, that asphalt melt, uh, that ice melts real quick. Absolutely, and um, I was having a little look on the government, on the city, pardon me, website, and uh, there is a, an abundance of parks, as you just mentioned, and plenty ample opportunity for mm -hmm. ice rinks. But I take it in the past, maybe there are, there's, say, for example, 15 ice rinks that could be made yeah. uh, in the parks around, but only a few of them would be made. Is it a priority for the city council this year to ensure that as many of these rinks, as many of these outdoor spaces are available to people so that they can participate in safe winter activities that just limit the way in which we're going to spread the virus, but also give people a bit of a, a respite from this feeling like yeah, it's a never sure. ending pandemic. Yeah, it definitely is. Uh, it's not necessarily a city council. It's definitely the priority for the city, the administration, uh, the community service department is making sure that that whatever opportunities that we can give our residents to go outside, enjoy that fresh air, and just take part in, in, in winter activities is definitely a priority because our mental health is definitely uh, important and we need to make sure that we can give as many opportunities to our residents uh, to enjoy the outdoors and take advantage of this pandemic to, to just go outside and, and enjoy the fun. And uh, at the finally here, just like at the risk of asking you to repeat yourself yeah. slightly, um, <laughs> what are some of the things you would say to people, residents who are coming down to enjoy this, but maybe obviously rubbing shoulders a little bit? Uh, just to, you know, make sure that you're keeping your two meters distance between each other, that you're not congregating, that you're staying within your bubble as best as possible, and to just bring a mask with you just in case that overcrowding does happen so that, you know, you can have that extra layer of protection just in case, because you never know. So always be a step up ahead uh, and, and to be safe and enjoy it. Perfect. Well, Sam, thank you very much for joining us in what for you must be relatively warm weather, but <laughs> I'm going to go pop back into the warm and uh, happy new year. So that's it for the first edition of TVC News this year. Welcome back to normality. If you want to hear a little bit more from any of the interviews in this or our previous programs, you can watch most of them in a longer format on our YouTube channel. Just head to the website and look for TVC 22. And if one of your resolutions has, to be, has been to try something new this year, well, you're in the right place. We're constantly on the lookout for volunteers and civilian journalists. So please, if you're interested in getting involved within the community, get in touch with us. And as always, if there is a story locally that you think some light shined on, then let me know. You can reach me by email at nouvelle, with an S at the end, at tvc22.ca, or by phone at 613-446-6037 extension number four or of course find us on any of our social media channels have a lovely weekend Clarence Rockland and I'll catch you next week goodbye so we've just concluded a lovely interview with councillor Sam Cardarelli about the available winter activities here in Clarence Rockland and uh, now I'm being forced in my workwear to go down the hill yay <laughs>
Um, I've got a lot of snow down my trousers, so let's go home. <laughs>